Good morning, uh, church. Good morning. Welcome to our um, worship service this faithful day of the Lord. Sunday, May 22nd. Sunday, May 22nd. Um, in our effort po, to approach our order of worship with reverence unto a, a God, uh, allow me to usher ourselves and everyone here into a time of welcoming announcements before our worship proper. No, so this is something that we are introducing in our worship service. Uh, this time we are bringing the welcoming announcements up front so that we can have a full worship proper later on. So again, good morning everyone and we welcome you into uh, today's worship. My name is Ian and I'm a member of uh, CBCM. And for those uh, who are new and first-time visitors, um, we welcome you uh, this morning with a joyful, um, um, a jub with jubilee, you know, uh, praising God for your presence. If, do we have a, a first-time visitor, Kuya Chonas? Yes, magandang umaga po, kapatid. Praise God po. Ano po ang pangalan nila? Praise God po, Sir Leo. Brother Leo, welcome po. Welcome po for uh, visiting us for the first time. And it is our prayer that for the everyone here, I uh, makapag-worship po tayo uh, fully you know, in, 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 in receiving God's word and singing praises to Him. Ayan. So again, so as part of our um, welcoming announcements, um, we would like to inform everyone of the following um, we have after our worship service, we will have our koinonia time. So we invite everyone to stay after the service. You can have a, um, a coffee break for a while, no? uh, a good uh, 10 minutes, seguro. And then we encourage you to please return into our sanctuary and find uh, specific uh, gatherings or fellowships where we can further discuss po yung ating pong mapapakinggang uh, mensahe for this morning. 
And so we also would like to uh, uh, encourage you uh, to visit or have on your playlist yung ating pong CBCM playlists where there is posted po yung ating mga, mga songs that we, we sing every Sunday. Um, this is something that is very useful uh, sa atin pong uh, daily walk with the Lord as well because the, the messages of the songs, they preach the gospel uh, to us. No? Uh, so this, these are very important things aside from us being familiar with the singing uh, with the songs and the hymns that we do every Sunday. Ayan. So once again, uh, we also would like to invite everyone during the week that we have our inductive Bible study. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, we, can you return, please? A basic Bible doctrine class every, um, every Sunday afternoon at 2. Later on uh, this afternoon, we will have another series of our uh, basic Bible doctrine class. No? So for those who have already attended please do please be reminded and this is over zoom also we have our inductive bible uh, study class also uh, during uh, during tuesdays uh, every week at 7:30 uh, doon po sa mga gustong mag uh, mag join and uh, and participate in this um, uh, class i uh, we are uh, encouraging everyone this is open for everyone and uh, we also have um, our weekly uh, worship service on Wednesdays, also at 7.30 over Zoom. This is where we pray for the concerns of our church. This is also a prayer meeting. And at the same time, it's a mini, uh, it's a midweek uh, worship service. Punate. So highly encouraged everyone to please uh, participate. Put it down your calendar. So para po tayo ay... Uh, um, continues ang ating pong fellowshipping with one another all throughout the week. And uh, in line with that, we also have our home fellowship groups. No? Well, we hope that uh, everyone here would eventually be um, connected to home fellowship groups where we can grow and, uh, and grow together and fellowship together and uh, be able to exercise yung covenant natin with one another. No? This is where we learn uh, God's word uh, further as as families and as, as uh, um, uh, yeah as, as families po, no so again these are the things that uh, are the activities that we'd like to uh, uh, inform everyone okay we also have uh, later on our worship in giving uh, we have envelopes at the back and we also have the QR codes for those who would want to uh, extend their um, their worship and giving to the Lord through digital means. No, so again, these are the things that we are putting up front now, so that our worship later on would be um, um, fully reverential unto God. No, and um, for those who would miss uh, uh, these announcements, uh, rest assured that we will be regularly posting this over our CBCM uh, general chat group. So, wag po kayong mag-alala dahil uh, lahat pong ito ay patuloy naman nating pinopost sa ating um, uh, regular chat group. Again, uh, I would like to encourage also remind everyone to have your bulletins with you. Uh, our ushers are giving this away and uh, we have uh, uh, a terrible part here, a, uh, a perforated uh, portion para po sa mga ating mga visitors like uh, Sir Leo. If you have something that you would want to... Uh, to uh, fill up here and uh, and give to to the uh, the pastors, no, so we can know you better after this. So, yung po ang ating um, uh, morning announcements, and I hope that uh, um, we are um, well informed uh, at this point. No, before we begin, I would like to invite everyone for a few moments of silence, okay, as we uh, prepare ourselves in our um, collective worship of our sovereign, triune, and holy God.
Let us all arise. Our scripture reading for today is Psalm chapter 8, 86, verses 7 to 12. In the day of my trouble, I call upon you, for you answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any work like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. May the Lord add blessings to the reading of his word. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, once again, we are gathering here to praise you and to thank you. Thank you for your love that endures forever. Thank you for your love that never fails. Though there are many times or ways, O Lord, that we have failed, we have not conceded your supply of your mercy and grace. Lord, thank you for the hope na binibigay niyo po sa amin that uh, strengthens us, O Lord, for your purpose. Indeed, you are worthy to be praised. There is none like you. Our faithful Father, thank you for revealing yourself to us through your word. As we have our service today, we pray, O Lord, that we would hear your voice. We ask, O Lord, your Holy Spirit would be at work. Open our ears to listen and hearts, O Lord, to receive your word. May you be glorified in everything that we are going to do today. In the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Magnificent, marvelous, matchless love too vast and astounding to tell Forever existing in worlds above Now offered and given to all O fountain of beauty eternal The Father, the Spirit, the Son Sufficient and endlessly generous and marvelous, matchless love. Creation is brimming with thankfulness, the mountains exultant they stand. The seasons rejoice in your faithfulness, all life is sustained by your hand. You crown every meadow with color, you paint every shade in the sky. Each day that the waves of the neck are off, magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. How great, how sure, His love endures forever. And marvelous, matchless love. What grace that you entered our brokenness, you came in the fullness of time. How far we have fallen from righteousness, but not from the mercies of Christ. Your cross is our door to redemption. Your death is our fullness of life. The day of forgiveness for us a flood. Magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. How great, how sure His love endures forever. Oh, 
darkness gnashes now United in your resurrection You lift us to infinite heights Could anything sever or take us from Magnificent, marvelous, matchless love How great, how sure His love endures forevermore Magnificent, marvelous, matchless love
longer fear the grave through this fragile life and never Christ will be my hideaway in you my God in you my God I trust you are strong you are strong Good morning, everyone. Uh, praise God this morning. Uh, will you join us in uh, the responsive reading of the Westminster Confession of Faith, Chapter 17, The Perseverance of Saints? Uh, for all the men, you can uh, read along with me, and for the ladies, you can uh, read along with uh, Christine. Uh, Okay, uh, let's begin. Those whom God has accepted in His beloved, effectually called, and sanctified by His Spirit, can neither totally nor finally fall away from the state of grace but shall certainly preserve in an eternal save. The perseverance of the saints does not depend upon their own free will, but on the unchangeableness of the decree of election, flowing from the free and unchangeable love of God the Father, on the efficacy of the merit and intercession of Jesus Christ, on the continuing presence of the Spirit and the seal of God within them, and on the nature of the covenant of grace. These are grounds of the certainty and infallibility of their perseverance. Nevertheless, they may through the temptation of Satan and of the world, the pervasiveness of the corruption remaining in them, and the neglect of the means by which they are to be preserved fall into grievous sins and for a time continue in them. And so, doing this, incur God's displeasure and grieve His Holy Spirit, some measure of grace and comforts in taking from them. They have their hearts hardened and their consciences wounded. They harm others and give them occasion to sin and bring temporal judgment upon themselves. Please join me as we pray as one body. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. Father, if not by your mercy, we would not know you. If not by your mercy, we could never know you. If not by your mercy, we would not be able to 
persevere in Christ-likeness. Father, everything that we are and everything that we are doing to serve you is all because you are merciful. And Father, the, the stubbornness and delay that we do in putting off our sins and rejecting your word, it is not because we are in control, it's because you are extending your mercy. It's because you are long-suffering. You are allowing us time to repent. Thank you. For you are a merciful, merciful Father. Your mercies are new every morning. You are so merciful that even the wicked receive sunshine. The wicked receive joy and they experience love and, and the blessings that you have generally allowed yourself for people to know. We thank you, for you are a merciful Father. There are so many things in our lives that had it not been for your mercy, Father, we would be in the deepest of sorrows or in the deepest of troubles. Yet not, not of our own doing, you bailed us out just because you are merciful. Your mercy is not a response to anything that we do, but is completely a prerogative that you give. Thank you, Father God. You are indeed a merciful Father. And so we ask, Father, for, for us to never take your mercy for granted. In our, in our families, in our lives. Father, we want to live our lives in a manner that gives glory to you and honors the mercy that you have so lavishly and freely bestowed upon us. Father, that is our prayer. Make our lives a resounding um, expression of the mercy that you have given us. In fact, Father, we pray that you would allow us to be just as merciful to everyone around us. Help us. Help us to see the gravity of what you have done, the sacrifice that you paid, the cost it took so that we could be reconciled with you, Father God. We know, Father, that from before the world began, you have already chosen who your children are. You know who your children are. Yet had it not been for your mercy, we never would have come to that knowledge. I pray, Father, if there's anyone in this room who is tiptoeing and tempting and testing if indeed you are merciful and still rejecting your word, Father, would you allow us to understand that while you are merciful, while your mercy is unfathomable to us, while your mercy overflows in a manner that we cannot understand, you are also a holy and just God. And your holiness cannot be mocked. Help us, Father, 
to also see you for who you truly are, a holy God who cannot let sin go unpunished. Would you put in us a healthy fear of you? We are in awe of you, of your power, but we are also in awe of you because no sin can be in your presence. You are holy, Father God. And that's what makes us being here able to worship you so miraculous. Because we are sinners. Yet because of your perfect righteousness, Jesus Christ, because of the perfect life that you lived because of you imputing your righteousness into us, we are reconciled with God the Father. And we no longer receive the due penalty that we deserve. You are holy, Father God. Impress that in our hearts in a world today where Holiness is not even an existing word anymore. Help us live holy lives as you have called us to live holy lives. Help us, Father, to turn away from wickedness. Help us to turn away from evil. Help us to turn away from the lusts of this world that promise nothing but emptiness while you are the water that never runs dry. Father, help us not to long for things that will not satiate our need. The only thing that will satisfy us, Father, is knowing you because we are created in your image and you've designed us to know you, to worship you, and to find our meaning in you. Father, I pray for this church, your church. Father, protect us from being anything else other than wanting to live holy and righteous lives for you. Help and protect our church to remain faithful to your word alone. Help us to resist the many false teachings out there. Protect us. None of us are wise on our own, but you are wise, Father. Give us the wisdom, Father, to know your word, to know how to honor you, to know your will, and that's in your word. Father, we pray that the families here, that they would be filled with a desire not to just succeed in this world, but first and foremost to please you and honor you in their lives. Beginning from the father, to the mothers, and to the children. If there's anyone that needs reminding today, they've tried everything. They've tried everything there is that the world can offer to make things right. Help them realize today nothing in this world can make them right because the problem is a spiritual one. It is you who can make it right. Not just make it right, you bring us new life. You give us new life. And so give us that faith, Father. Give us the faith to believe according to your will. Father, we pray for our nation. We ask for your continued uh, wisdom for all our leaders, um, outgoing and incoming. Father, would you 
first and foremost, according to your will, would you allow them to bow down to you? Now I know they will bow down to you one way or another, but if it be your will, if they would bow down to you now so they would serve you, please give them the wisdom to do what is right. Please help them to refuse things that are wrong. Help them to love this country and the people in it so that they may put uh, its needs first. And I again pray for the believers. We pray for the believers in these government offices. Help them to be like Stephen, like Peter, like Paul, to stand firm for you. May the people around them see that what we truly need in this life is Christ. And for us, Father, help us to be faithful uh, citizens that glorify your name in all that we do. Finally, Father, we thank you for the privilege to be able to study your word. Help us, Father, to only hear what is truth. Help us not to retain anything that is not true. Protect me from saying anything that is not true. And help us to focus on your word this morning and to focus on what it is that you might want to convict us uh, in them. Thank you, Father God. Thank you for this privilege and this opportunity to worship you now through the reading and through the study of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Please open your Bibles to Acts 15. Are we still giving away Pastor Raul um, ESVs? Because I'm still seeing some people without uh, Bibles. Ano yung sabi ng mga lola at lola natin? Pupunta ba kayo sa gera ng walang barel? It's okay. I know, I know you have digital means. Um, for the single men and single ladies here, you want to attract the right person, you, you bring a Bible with you. Right? You, you carry a big Bible with you. It will scare yung mga hindi seryoso sa buhay. Okay? But it will attract the right ones. Okay? I mean, I see you looking at my ESV. Right? Sorry, that's uh, for you young people here. That's a TikTok phrase. <laughs> Okay, so please read with me Acts 15, and um, let's read from verse 19. Just a quick refresher, but let's read from verse 19 to 29. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled, and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders, with the whole church, to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brothers, with the following letter, the brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, 
Greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions, it has seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from what has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. God bless the reading of his word. So the question is, the question is salvation by law or by grace, that's no longer the debate, right? We're done with that. That's no longer the issue. The question is settled. Salvation, justification, forgiveness of sins is by grace alone, through faith in Christ alone, right? Ephesians 2 Eight, nine. I hope you've memorized this verse already. We've been reading it every Sunday. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. You would have to do scriptural circus to, to, to see that uh, it's not a gift from God. And uh, you would have to do a lot of hula hoops to not see that there, right? The issue of whether Gentiles, non-Jews, are also saved by grace through faith in Christ is settled. Peter provides this by reminding everyone how the Lord allowed the Holy Spirit to dwell uh, in Cornelius and his family the moment they believed in Christ. James, the half-brother of Christ, would remind everyone that it should come as no surprise to anyone that Gentiles are also saved by grace through faith. The Old Testament has prophesied this already. And what is happening here in Acts is a fulfillment of that prophecy. God designed it in such a way that salvation would first be in, remember, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Amen. <clears throat> Salvation is by grace alone. Amen. Any gospel, any gospel that teaches otherwise, any teacher that teaches otherwise, any church that teaches otherwise, any group that teaches otherwise is not consistent with the gospel that Christ has taught the apostles and is not consistent with the gospel that the apostles have taught the early Christians through the Holy Spirit and is not consistent with the written word of God authored by the Holy Spirit using the apostles as his instruments. There is no other gospel. Galatians 1, 8, 9. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel, contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be anathema. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be anathema. Do not be deceived, brothers and sisters. The gospel is not something that adapts and changes in time depending on society. The world may change our leaders may change, our societies may change, the laws of the land may change, people may change, but the gospel will remain. 
and will always remain. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, as we remain faithful to it, through Scripture alone, as we labor and pursue Christ's likeness for God's glory alone. Let's pray. now. <laughs> we can end. So the blessing that we will be able to see in verses 22 to 29 uh, is not so much doctrinal any more than it is instructional. Okay, major instructions tayo today. Now, a lot of preachers would just skim through this. Okay, but brothers and sisters, remember the Bible is inspired. It is theopneustos. It is God inspired. So not just some of it, but all of it. So we should never have an attitude of reading the Bible thinking some parts are more important than others or that there are some parts where they're just stories or narratives or historical movements and there's not much benefit in studying that. These verses this morning that we're going to go through, um, it's not doctrinal because that part has been settled already. However, it's quite vital to learn and see how the early church modeled going through such a situation. Okay? What were the steps they took? And how they implemented it all. The error has already been identified. The truth has already been clarified and defended. And so now they need to communicate this to the Gentiles from Antioch. And here is how the early church, the church of Jerusalem, models how they go about this for us. Okay? Let's begin. Verse 22a. <clears throat> then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders <clears throat> with the whole church. We see here an example of an issue. An issue that hits at the very core of our beliefs uh, that you see here, the involvement and active participation of everyone in the church. Right? The next steps after clarifying the truth about salvation, involved not just the apostles, but the apostles, the elders, and the whole church, right? We're not saying that's how it should always be for every issue. If we're going to decide what coffee we should have at the back, we're not going to gather all of you and take a vote, right? Black coffee, okay? <laughs> Macchiato, wow, my macchiato, right? We're not, it's, that's not every situation, okay? But clearly in this situation where a key doctrine was attacked and fellow brothers and sisters in a sister church or daughter church, are affected, and so the members of that church didn't see this issue as something that only the church leaders had to deal with. They felt convicted in themselves that they needed to be part of this solution. And the only way you as a member of a church can get convicted in doctrinal matters is if you yourself are spending personal time in doctrinal study. Of course, if you don't see Bible study, if you don't see knowing the Word as important in your life, then of course you wouldn't care about doctrinal issues in the church. Brothers and sisters, that is what a healthy church life is. A healthy church life is not having a lot of activities and events. Many churches are filled with activities and events, but devoid of scriptural worth. Every member is a ministering member. CBCM distinctive puyan, by the way. You can read it in one of the tarpaulins at the back. Ministering to other believers, ministering in the furtherance of the Lord's kingdom through various means, ministering. 
If you're coming to church with the intention to only be blessed, to only be served, and to only be cared for, while those are blessings that we can indeed receive when we belong to a local church, that is not why we go to church. In today's evangelical environment, it's so easy to church hop, right? It's so easy to hop from one church to another. It's, it's so easy to demand things from the church, but never looking at our own selves, how we can be of service to the church and the church body. And so here, the entire church was playing a role in framing the solution to this issue. The entire church. Verse 22b. Okay. Verse 22b. To choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Here, we're going to begin seeing true Christian love towards other believers in various ways. First, if you remember the church of Antioch, they didn't just send Paul and Barnabas to the church of Jerusalem, did they? Right? They appointed what? Some men to accompany Paul and Barnabas. Perhaps for the safety, maybe for companionship. Medyo mahaba po yung lakad na yon. Okay? Uh, but also to inquire themselves about the issue at hand. So we see here a level of care as the church of Jerusalem themselves select chosen men. Sila rin nag-select ng chosen men. We're not talking about random men. They chose specific men of what? Great influence to go down to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Again, maybe for safety and companionship, but also to provide even more assurance that Paul and Barnabas were right. They were in the right. And perhaps to be used as an encouragement as well for the believers at the Antioch church. Alam niya po today, with, uh, there's a lot of churches that desire to have multiple branches. I grew up in a church, ang mission vision namin. In 2025, we need to have 25 daughter churches. Well, how do you even plot a mission like that, right? And that, that's not our mission here. In 2025, you know what the CBCM's mission is? The same. Preach the gospel. Discipleship, right? And no daughter churches. We, we might help churches establish. We might plant churches. Right? But we're not going to be calling them daughter or sister churches as if they owe us something. That's not the, uh, that's not the New Testament uh, church model. Okay? We're not a corporation. <laughs> okay? So today there's multiple daughter churches and, and there's sometimes a silent, but at least in my observation, it's silent, but there's an existing arrogance attached towards the people of the mother church. Try not to react. I, you know, ayoko malaman if na if you can relate, right? Thinking they might be more superior than the other churches, and so the church of Jerusalem could have easily just sent Paul and Barnabas back and tell them, "We've made a decision. Now deal with it." back at your church. That's not what they do. They select trustworthy and influential and godly men to accompany Paul and Barnabas to help communicate and clarify the truth, but also to strengthen the testimony of Paul and Barnabas in case it was affected by the Judaizers who probably tried to degrade their authority at Antioch. Verse 22c, they sent Judas called Barsabbas and Silas or Silvanus, leading men among the brothers. So these two 
These two were the leading men of the church of Jerusalem. Barsabbas, we don't know a whole lot about. But Silas, we do know a bit about. And we can assume that this spiritual maturity, his spiritual maturity, would be perhaps at the same level as Silas, leading men. Right? Silas was actually a regular companion of the Apostle Paul in his missionary work. San ba natin siya maikita? In, in 1 Thessalonians, for example, 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. Silvanus and Silas, same person. Huh? To the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. Um, in 2 Corinthians 1.19, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Silvanus and Timothy and I, sila yung tropa. Okay, sila yung, uh, they, were the, they were together for the gospel. Okay, and I was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. Now just on the side, just on the side here, what exactly does it mean to be leading men? What does it mean to be leading men among the brothers? Because if I look at the evangelical environment today of churches, if I was to define leading men among a church based on what I see or what I observe, I might come to the conclusion that leading men are rich entrepreneurs, presidents and CEOs of corporations, celebrities, or anyone with great charisma regardless of their individual and spiritual lives, as well as regardless of their family's testimonies. Is that what makes a man uh, a leading man uh, in a church? You can answer to that one. No. No. The Bible defines it this way. Hebrews 13, 7. Remember your leaders. Remember them, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Leading men speak the word of God. That means they spend time diligently in the word of God so they can confidently and truthfully speak about it, edify others through it, and in fact, they depend on it. Their way of life is an outcome, an evident outcome of their commitment to the Word of God. And that's why we are encouraged to imitate them. Brothers and sisters, just because you are someone important in society, just because you have a certain set of skills, or just because you desire it does not make you qualified to be a church leader or a church teacher. If that is how it is in other churches, that is not how it should be biblically and is not how it is here in CBCM. A church leader's goal is not to lord over people, but to guide people into truth, with love, tenderness, graciousness, patience, humility, joy, eagerness, compassion, mercy, and, and so much more. That's what a leading man in the church is. Parang uh, nag-shrink yung mga men sa, 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 ano, sa seats. Praise God. The Lord is reminding us the kind of men we are supposed to be. Verse 23a. With the following letter. Okay. So, so now that it's been decided that along with Paul and Barnabas that they will be sending Barsabbas and Silas, it is now decided that the decision and guidelines in addressing the issue, susulat rin. 
would also be written down. We don't know exactly who wrote the letter. It's possible, and this is where I'm leaning towards, it's possible that James, being the leader of this church, was the one who wrote it on behalf of the apostles, the elders, and the congregation. And this is quite crucial. Itong uh, decision nila, given wisdom by the Holy Spirit, to write it down. Okay? Why? God did not just give us oral testimony of Himself, right? He produced for us His Word in written form. And because of that, we have a sure foundation of the Lord's promises, instructions, commands, rebukes, and warnings. What a joy to know that salvation by grace alone, not only for the Jew, but also for the Gentiles, was not something just given verbally. The Lord wanted this truth written down immediately, as early as then, to ensure believers could always come back to that letter and be affirmed and encouraged that they are indeed in Christ. Amen. Verse 23b, the brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. And so I mentioned we will learn about true Christian love and charity in this passage. Here at the very beginning of the letter, notice uh, James, or, or the writer, he greets the Gentile Christians from Antioch, and what does he call them? brothers. The letter informs them who it's from, and it's not just from a subset of the church of Jerusalem. It's from everyone, the brothers, the apostles, and the elders of the church of Jerusalem. And then, and then it says to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. That's like Troy um, going out partying one night and committing sin and coming home and Brother Chris telling him, my son, welcome home, right? You're reminded, you're reminded right away, look, our relationship didn't change. Our relationship didn't change. You're my son. And so James, through the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, decides and starts that letter by saying, we're brothers. You're my brethren. Think of all the arguments that you have had, and maybe you wouldn't have had them if you had just started with that premise. No? This is my brethren. This is my brother. This is my sister. Imagine the many arguments you would have not done if you had started with the premise that you were brothers and sisters in the faith. The brothers, the apostles, and then whatever else is to be said, alam na natin, whatever comes after this letter, it will be under the premise that they are equal in rank. And they are equal in privileges with those of the Judeo-Christians. And they're looked at as brethren. Looked at as brethren. Verse 24. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions, if verse 23b would immediately give comfort and assurance to the Gentile Christians, verse 24 would immediately justify Paul and Barnabas to them. Justify. Bakit? In one simple sentence, the Jerusalem church clarifies to the Gentile Christians that these Jews that went to you, these Jews uh, that spoke to you, they went without our instruction, which means the contents of everything they said has no blessing from us. 
They had no authority to do what they had done and no authority to say what they had said. Siguro nung nabasa ni Paul yun at saka ni, ni Barnabas dun sa letter. Yes. <laughs> Praise God. Vindicated. Vindicated. On the side, if there's any of you here waiting for vindication, you, maybe you have been wronged, maybe you have been accused wrongly, wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Do not take things into your own hands. The Lord is teaching you to be patient. Patiently endure this suffering. Okay? The Lord himself was accused incorrectly. Be gracious that you are being given the privilege to suffer with Christ. Okay? And when the Lord vindicates you, when that day comes, it will be um, as it should have been and in the best way that it could have been. Okay? Trust in the Lord, huh? Kung sino man kayong uh, are waiting or praying for vindication. Next thing we take from this verse, tingnan nyo yung result of the efforts of false teachers and false teaching. Ano ang fruits ng false teachers and false teaching? It troubled the people. It unsettled their minds. Brothers and sisters, when the Holy Spirit sends true teachers who speak from Scripture, its listeners will not be troubled. They will not be confused. They will have peace in their hearts and in their minds. Theologian Stark says it like this, The Holy Ghost does not send false teachers. They come without authority. They do not edify, but only confuse and distress. Even a sound doctrine cheers the heart and makes it strong in God, so false doctrine unsettles the soul and does not allow it to find true peace. If you're a true believer of God, if you hear false doctrine, you're going to feel a trouble in your heart and in your mind. You're going to feel an unsettling feeling. Verse 25 to 26, It has seemed good to us, having come to one accord to choose men, and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, unlike the Judaizers who went to Antioch without authority and without blessing, the men now on their way to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas which is Barsabbas and Silas, have explicit authority and they have explicit blessing to go down there. Nakita niyo yung opposite? No? They have the authority to communicate to them not a message of yoke and burden, but a message of joy and hope. And not only that, the Jerusalem church praised the Lord for the lives of Paul and Barnabas. Why? Because they were men who were willing to sacrifice even their lives for the Lord Jesus, for the confession of his name and for his honor. Again, Paul and Barnabas being justified and vindicated in this letter. And so this is what it means to truly be a servant of Christ, to boldly stand and follow Christ despite the persecution you will receive for doing so. That's what it means to be a true servant of Christ. Many Christians today would rather just compromise and side with the world just so they don't feel or experience persecution. Do not compromise, brothers and sisters. Do not compromise. 
it, it's not uh, part of this passage, but do you guys know how James passed away? Uh, basically, there was a, uh, a riot. Um, uh, I'm talking about James. <laughs> I'm talking about James. Uh, there was basically a riot. And so um, they started stoning him. They dragged him to the rooftop of the church. And they were stoning him there. And since uh, they, um, and then they kicked him off the roof of that church. It was a fairly high church. So he fell down, okay? Fell down, broken and bruised already. They took a big rock on top of the church and, um, and it took several men to push that stone down to him. It fell on James, but it didn't kill him. So what did they do? They took small rocks and they went near him and started stoning him to death. And guess what James said as well? The same thing that Stephen and Christ said. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's what it means to be a true servant of Christ. It's not doing all these activities, running around church and looking busy. Are you, ask yourself this, brothers and sisters, are you willing to boldly stand for Christ and His Word in your life, in your families? The pressures, the temptations that the world is throwing, are you able, do you want to, do you desire? That's the definition of a true servant of Christ. Why? Because we know we already have everlasting life, right? If we die, the worst thing that can happen is we wake up in heaven. That's not so bad, right? That's the worst thing that can happen. So why will you be scared of the world? Don't be scared of men who can kill only the physical body. You honor the one who raises the dead. This is what it means to truly be a servant of Christ. J.C. Ryle put it this way, if we are faithful and decided servants of Christ, the world will certainly hate us as it hated our master. In one way or another, Grace will always be persecuted. No consistency of conduct, however faultless, no kindness and amiability of character, however striking, will exempt a believer from the world's dislike so long as they live. It is foolish to be surprised at this. It is mere waste of time to murmur at it. It is a part of the cross, and we must bear it patiently. You know what's also interesting? You remember, right? James died in that manner, but do you remember? James at the very beginning was even disowning his relationship with Christ. He was a doubter of Christ. But that's the power of the transforming gospel of Christ. Someone who doubted Christ became a church leader who was very strict in his own obedience and yet was very gentle and loving to everyone else, to the Gentiles, became the leader of the Jerusalem church, would be martyred and died in the way that I told you, and would still be able to pray for compassion and mercy for those throwing stones at him. That's what it means to truly be transformed by Christ. Verse 27. 
We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. So it seems the apostles and elders and congregation of the Jerusalem church are implying an importance in not just reading the letter, but also hearing the letter as it is read. Pero alam na po natin yan, right? It's obvious. Today, while we read Scripture on our own, it is just as vital that we listen to Scripture being taught and explained uh, as the Holy Spirit enlightens these men who speak to us on Scripture. Verse 28, For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements. Now, of course, it would be good for the Holy Spirit and for them to lay no greater burden because as Christ has taught, salvation is His grace alone through faith in Him alone. That's what this means. This does not mean that the apostles somehow determined something and assumed that what was good for them is also good for the Holy Spirit. Huh? The bottom line is that any Gentile who is a true believer of Christ is exempt from any Mosaic legality. However, there are four things that the Jerusalem church would like them to observe. Verse 29, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well, farewell. What's very different here versus the demands that the Judaizers made, if you look at the sentence, it doesn't say, do these things or else. It says, if you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. It's a serious matter, right? I mean, sexual immorality, all these things. And, and, of course, the, the sacrifice to, uh, sorry, yung blood, that's more of respecting their Jewish brothers, right? I mean, again, yung mga kumakain po ng uh, dinuguan dito, you have the freedom to do so, okay? Keep yourselves from these. It, it's a serious matter, but it has a counselor tone to it. It has a mentor uh, tone and it doesn't mention anything about salvation, does it? But it does say you will do well. Well, what does you will do well mean? You will have peace. That's what it means if you will do well. You will have peace. Peace uh, because not only are you striving to abstain from physical lusts, you're abstaining from offending your Jewish brothers in the faith. And striving to love God and to love your neighbors, well, isn't that at the core of the commandments? To love God means to abstain from our worldly desires and put God above everything. And to love our neighbors is to abstain from our personal desires and put others above ourselves, right? Mark 12, 28 to 33. And, and one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, asked them, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is what? Much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Brothers and sisters, true Christian love is not about sacrificing truth and compromising our faith for the sake of unity in relationships. 
True Christian love opposes error. Let me repeat, true Christian love opposes error. It is, in the, it is in this act of opposing error that love for believers is truly magnified. I remember the seven woes of Christ. Remember that? The seven woes that Jesus Christ gave to the religious leaders in Matthew 23. These were seven hard warnings to the hypocrisy of religion. And while those woes may have been seen and heard as very painful, and with Christ using very specific words or phrases like blind guides, brood of vipers, hypocrites. But if those woes were not communicated out of a love for truth, people would not know the hypocrisy of their religion and their false teachers, and they may have remained stuck in their lives, forever condemned, forever not knowing that they were in error. Finally, the letter ends with the word farewell. You know what that word really means? It comes from the older term, fare ye well. Fare ye well. Which actually doesn't mean goodbye. It means to do well. Sometimes in the, even in today, sometimes in the English language, you might be asked, how did you fare? Right? How did you fare? What that means is, how did you do? So farewell means an encouragement to do well. To do well in what? Well, given the context of this letter, perhaps it can be summarized as this. Now that you are assured that your salvation is indeed by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and you know that desiring to abide in the four things given to you, which are actually just fruits of loving God and loving your neighbors, when I say farewell, what I mean to say is be faithful to Jesus. Be faithful to the one who has saved you by his grace so that in him and through the Holy Spirit, you may do well. I'm reminded of the song, um, Trust and Obey, uh, for there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Brothers and sisters, farewell. Farewell. Let's pray. Father, all we desire is to be true servants of you. Whatever is in our hearts or in our minds that is hindering this, Father, would you set us free from this? Would you give us the conviction, the diligence, the support, the, the honesty, the humility to repent of this? We don't want to just be lip servers of you. We want to be servants of you. Would you continue refining our lives so that like James and Paul and Barnabas and Silas and Bersabbas, at any moment, we can be used for your glory. We can be used to edify other people, other believers. At any moment, we can be used for the furtherance of your kingdom. Help us to truly desire to be your servant. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. May I request the congregation to stand. Okay.
Praise God for the worship and the song and response. Let's now move on to our worship and giving. Let me just share to you a verse in Deuteronomy um, chapter 16, verses 6, 16b to 17. It says there, They shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord, your God, that he has given you. So giving remains our act of worship. Giving back to God is not about God lacking, but about God abounding. It's an outward manifestation of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Giving is one manifestation. These fruits, as we have, uh, we are reminded of in Galatians. It says there that, but, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Those first three are all internal 
fruits. And so, the manifestation, the physical manifestation of that is the joy of giving back to God. And so, um, as I've been um, um, reminded earlier, we have uh, the means to, to, uh, to offer God our, our offerings. And so with that, I would like to everyone to um, bow down with me and pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for reminding us of your goodness and your righteousness through the faithful preaching of your word to us this morning. Would you continue to use your word in sanctifying us, in renewing our minds, and reforming our ways for the glory of your name? Father, would you also receive our worship of you through giving this morning as our expression of love, the joy, the peace, and indeed all the favors that which your Son, our Savior, and our Lord Jesus Christ secured for us at Calvary. In his precious name, we pray all these things. Amen. Church, as we come to a close, I would like to invite everyone to be in a moment of silence and reflect on the message that we have heard. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Have a blessed week, church. Go in peace and be faithful to Jesus. Good morning. Yeah.